But there were these so-called high-yielding varieties which were high-response varieties created other scarcity. First, they replaced biodiverse systems which were rich in production with monocultures. And then, because only the yield of single crops was measured, crops that would then be commodities, the declining output of the disappeared crops never went into the equation. Now, India was the biggest grower of pulses that we use for dals and other source of proteins for a largely vegetarian country, as well as oil seeds. They just disappeared from our farming systems. Today, we are the biggest importer of oil seeds and the biggest importers of pulses. And of course, Australia and the United States subsidize their farmers, I think even Canada, they now subsidize their farmers to sell dals to India because nobody else eats dal in the rest of the world. We are the only dal eaters of the world. But Green Revolution dis made those sources of protein disappear and that destruction was never counted. And hands down, the biodiverse organic systems work in producing more food. But if you then start to inc include other costs, uh, you realize that this breeding, which was supposed to be improved varieties for increased productivity, hasn't done such a good job either. Um, it constantly requires higher external inputs, including higher fossil fuel use. And you get systems like the US systems, which are supposed to be more productive, but they're using 380 times more energy per hectare than Asian paddy farms fields. And you could run down um, any, in corn, Mexico produces the same amount of corn for 176 times less energy input per acre. India is the land of very high diversity of animal breeds. So many of the breeds in Brazil, so many of the breeds in Africa have actually gone from India. But in India are brilliant breeds the Ongol, the Rati, the Hansi, the Kankrej, the Kenkata, the Kerigar, the Malvi, the Tharpakar, the Amrit Mahal, the Halikar, the Kilari, the Kangyam, the Gir, the Dangi, they all were replaced for crossbreds of Jersey, Holstein, Red Dane, and Brown Swiss. Mm. Now the measure was higher milk production, but none of the indigenous breeds were bred for milk alone. They provided animal energy. After all, animals are used for plowing fields, transporting in bullock carts. They provided inputs to the farm. And um, if you were to measure the efficiency and productivity of the crossbreds in terms of animal energy, they're as good as useless. And definitely, if you were to measure their inputs for farming systems, the only inputs that are really worth it in terms of pest control, in terms of fertility rejuvenation, farmers use indigenous breeds in India. You can't, you can't have the same healing qualities with the crossbreds. Even when measured purely in terms of the yield of singular crops, there was actually a depletion of nutrient value. There was recently, I think two years or three years ago, a report published from the American College of Nutrition. Uh, it's changes in the USDA food composition data for 43 garden crops from 1950 to 1999. The paper reported substantial decreases in 6 out of 13 nutrients with 6% decline in protein and 38% uh, decline in riboflavin and reductions were reported in calcium, phosphorus, iron, ascorbic acid, etc. So one can say very honestly that not only did the breeding for chemicals reduce your biodiversity, it actually robbed you of nutrition. And that's another reason why we need to reconnect to the breeding that treated food as food, as nourishment for human beings. 
we now, of course, are entering the next stage of breeding. And that next stage of breeding is connected to genetic engineering. It is not breeding. It's not the kind of careful observation that selects the traits that you want to evolve into the future. It's shooting in the blind. Arpad Putsan was punished badly for doing an honest piece of research with the GMO potatoes, sponsored by the government of the United Kingdom. And then when his results showed, to his own surprise, there's rats, the brains were shrinking, the pancreas was expanding, and the immunity system was collapsing, and he was removed. That's the one sentence he uses. He said it's shooting in the dark. You don't know where that transgene will land, where in the genome it will be. You don't know what it will actually do. And now more and more data is coming out that in the second generation there's a huge scramble. The French ban on MON810 was related to the study that showed that GMOs are totally unstable. The next generation just does not reproduce what was predicted to be the trait. There's a huge scrambling of the genetic structure and a scrambling that is absolutely unpredictable. Genetic engineering is now being offered as the miracle cure for climate change and you must all have seen the non-stop ads in every magazine and newspaper of the world. From the International Herald Tribune and the Financial Times and the Economist all the way to the Times of India and the Hindustan Times and I'm sure in every other country, whatever was your big paper. And this is what Monsanto was saying. It claimed that genetically engineered organisms are a cure both for food security and climate change. The ad read, 9 billion people to feed a changing climate, now what? Producing more, conserving more, improving farmers' lives, that's sustainable agriculture, and that's what Monsanto is all about. Yes. You all know it's not true. Firstly, GM crops are not producing more. We've seen that in India with the BT cotton. Doug Sherman has shown it for crops in the United States. Uh, Monsanto's claims for BT cotton were 1,500 kilograms per acre. The average yields that we've studied from 97 onwards when they started the trials illegally and I had to take them to court to stop the trials. From that time to commercialization, 300 to 400 is the average yield. Now they even put up ads, you know, posters all over villages, how a farmer called Radesham had 1,500. So we said, is something wrong with our studies that we are finding 200, 300 to 400? So we found this Radhe Sham in a Madhya Pradesh village. And he said, yeah, I got 1,500 on five acres. They just changed the five to one. Now, the desperation of the industry is growing with the experience that people are having. In India, since 97, we've had 200,000 suicides of farmers. 84% of these are concentrated in the BT cotton area. And it's directly linked to the high cost of seed because now it's a monopoly, it's patented. Seven rupees was what farmers paid for cotton seed before the GM technology. After the GM technology, the price went up to 1,700. Monsanto still arguing that once we have a patent, no state can interfere on the issue of monopoly. The, now, you know, the monopoly is our right. But the monopoly is killing farmers. It's, of course, it's killing diversity. <laughs>